Today, I wanted to have a slightly longer conversation about uh, what happens when IVF fails. And uh, when I say when I, what happens when IVF fail, I mean either failed of implantation or an implantation that's just temporary, we call that a biochemical pregnancy, or um, a pregnancy that goes a little bit longer and there's a miscarriage. And uh, I think that it's a big topic because obviously as IVF has gotten a lot better as a treatment, you must remember that when IVF first started 30 something years ago, um, it was not a good treatment. It was a very inefficient and not very efficacious treatment. So uh, there was a greater tolerance on part of uh, people for failure. But today, as IVF has become a much better technology, there's an expectation of success. And, uh, and uh, the whole focus of IVF has changed in the sense that uh, instead of the, sort of the trial and error type of thing, we have now created a, an approach, the doctors, not us, I mean, us reproductive endocrinologists, have created an approach which is focused 100% on success, right? That means obtaining the best embryos and testing the embryos to make sure that they are genetically normal. And we could have a whole discussion about that. But so there's this whole goal which is driven towards obtaining success on a per try basis. So you're not starting the pro in the old days we just used to transfer every single embryo and we would just try over and over. Now it's like, no, no, what we're gonna do, we're gonna optimize everything. So we're gonna transfer the best embryos and we're gonna give you the very best chance. So the stakes have basically become higher. The stakes have become a lot higher. And, um, and therefore, whenever there is a failure, uh, the, when this failure happens, it's a lot has been going on. Sometimes multiple cycles, embryo banking, PGS, lots of money spent. And so a failure is very devastating for people who go through IVF. It becomes like a, a tragedy. And of course, the questions of why, why have we failed, it really come up uh, a lot sooner than in the old days when, and by old days, I say maybe 10, 15 years ago, it's not like a uh, hundred years ago. But now that we have built this system, this approach where it's all about giving it one huge try, throwing the sink at it, and uh, it, the failure becomes a lot, a lot more painful as an experience. Oh. And similarly, because there's so much riding on every transfer, uh, the, the, the questions that arise after a failure are, are also very legitimate, the question of the why. Because the assumption is like, okay, we're, we've done this, we've done the, we've done the retrievals, we need more than one retrieval, we've done the embryo banking, we've done the embryo testing, PGS, PGT, and now, okay, we've done the transfer, what to do now? And uh, that we have not had a success. Now, uh, different philosophical approaches have emerged, okay? One, one philosophical, because medicine, unfortunately, is still an inexact science. There is still a lot of there's still a lot of uh, disagreement amongst doctors in medicine. I'm not just saying talking about fertility. I'm talking about medicine in general. There's like significant disagreement about many many topics, and, and the same thing applies to fertility. So one approach is that of is the approach of the sort of like keep on trying approach where. You know, because the, there's a certain lack of deep science, the idea is that, well, you know, it hasn't worked. Let's just keep on trying and sooner or later you'll have success. And uh, it's I would call this kind of like a brute force type of approach. And um, and uh, this is a kind of approach that uh, I feel that can pay. It can pay, but it can pay only if you have uh, very significant financial resources and 
you're younger, so you can make a lot of embryos. And so like, it's like you have a lot of arrows in your quiver and you just keep on throwing these arrows at the target until you hit the target. And uh, I do not necessarily uh, sign on to this type of approach because I think that it is an approach that uh, can be extremely painful and risky for people. Uh, my personal, and you know, like I said, I'm talking about personal because, I have, like I said, doctors of different perspective. I follow more the philosophy of uh, the the philosophy of personalized medicine, in which I believe it's worth to troubleshoot and try to figure out what's going on. And uh, and uh, although I do agree that on some of these aspects the science can be softer, uh, I uh, I would argue that there isn't any deep science in the what I call the um, you know the keep on trying approach because that's just like keep on trying. What's scientific about that? That's just like a brute force approach, right? So when you're talking about the personalized medicine approach, you're looking at figuring out what are the different steps in the process that can create a problem. Uh, for example, let's talk about let's start with implantation, right? So you want to look at first of all the timing of the implantation. And uh, there's a whole way to figure that out. There's different tests. You know, certainly the ERA is a test that has certainly caught on. And it's based on some pretty sound scientific evidence. And uh, it's certainly a test that does help adjust the starting of the progesterone, hence the timing. Uh, it's, it's based on metabolomics, on, use, on looking at certain expression of certain genes at certain stages in the uh, in the cycle during the, st- the preparation cycle, and it has a certain level of reliability. You know, there are studies that show that when uh, when the ERA test is done, uh, there is an increase in uh, successful implantation rates, and uh, obviously, it doesn't take people from uh, you know thirty percent to one hundred percent. It's it's an incremental improvement, but. A lot, of the, a lot of this intervention, I think what people need to understand that many of these interventions are going to be incremental. They're not going to be from zero to 100. You know, every intervention can have 10, 15 percent. But, you know, in the end, success in anything is built incrementally uh, in medicine and many other aspects of life. So whatever intervention you do, you'll add a little bit until you get where you want to get. So certainly that for the timing, you, you're looking at that. Obviously, uh, after that, you also have to look at, uh, and I obviously, being an endometriosis specialist myself, I, I have to, I've seen the value of looking for endometriosis. And uh, clearly, the indication for looking for endometriosis has to be based on multiple, multiple factors. Um, it's a little bit easier for people who know they have endometriosis, where you could see endometriosis, you could see cysts or there's clinical signs of endometriosis, that would be would certainly prompt us to looking for it and trying to remove it beforehand if there's a history of implantation failure. For somebody who doesn't have any symptoms, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, certainly, from that perspective, there are various tests that are available, one of them being the, ER, uh, the, sorry, the, um, uh, the BCL6 test. Uh, which is a marker that's associated with endometriosis. And there's different companies that offer BCLC, BCLC testing. One of them is called the Receptiva, um, but also you can do it through Yale. And, and these are tests that uh, predict the presence of uh, certain uh, proteins that are associated uh, with endometriosis. Um, there's about an 80% correlation. Uh, and... Uh, my perspective on that is that if if there's a doubt, it's certainly worth looking and it's certainly worth to investigate. Um, so that's the second part that we just talked about, endometriosis. Another important aspect, which is, uh, of course, the, another one that is very close to, to my heart because that's where I've done a lot of work, an area where I've done a lot of work on is to look at the immunological component and you know when I say immunological it's it's a vast it's a vast field because it's more I would say it's not just immunological we're looking at inflammation more generically more, more broadly rather than generically 
And uh, what we're looking at, obviously, we're looking at different aspects, right? We're looking, number one, uh, we're looking if, uh, the, at the compatibility component. And we do know that HLA compatibility plays a big role in implantation and tolerance to the, to the embryo on the part of the mother. You're looking at uh, presence of autoimmunity and uh, mm, autoimmune disease is, uh, uh, it, uh, has such a spectrum where many individuals may have a propensity towards autoimmunity without having actual autoimmune disease. Or some people have actual autoimmune disease and they don't know it. So that's another aspect of it. And then nutritional, because we do know that there's nutritional components uh, that play a role in the, in the inflammatory process. So that's another part uh, that needs to be looked at. And uh, certainly what we do uh, at Pregimmune, uh, which is uh, the company that I founded, which looks at um, this whole spectrum of the immunological implantation, both from a genetic, nutritional, and uh, serological aspect, that's what's where you're going to get a lot of information on that. And um, in that case, if there's immunological problems, there are corrective actions that can be also implemented. Similarly, with the progesterone star for the ERA or surgery for endometriosis, there are immunolog simple immunological interventions uh, uh, that can also be implemented. Uh, and there are randomized perspective studies on this, um, uh, which have been performed in top-notch centers in, the, in Europe, uh, mostly because a lot of the research has, uh, on uh, immunology has actually come out of uh, the big, big universities uh, in the northern countries of Europe. And uh, so um, there's significant evidence of benefits for implantation failure and, of course, miscarriages in using uh, um, immunological treatments like intravenous immunoglobulins or prednisone or, or um, uh, other immune modulators. So uh, it's a whole plethora of, of uh, investigations that are, that are part of what we call really personalized medicine. So it's the personalized medicine approach. And uh, I am... A, uh, a proponent of the personalized medicine approach, of the individualized approach, because I think that the brute force approach is very risky. And, and the reason why I think it's risky is that what I see is that uh, a lot of failures that I see in the quote unquote brute force approach happen because people keep on trying and trying and trying, and then they find themselves sort of stuck that they've used up all their embryos and now they can't make any more or they've run out of money or, and, and the biggest risk is that running out of embryos and then you have to just fall back into, because you've gotten older and then you fall back into egg donation, which, you know, certainly is a valid alternative, but you know, why not plan ahead? I think, you know, why not just try to do all your due diligence instead of saying, Oh, okay. If you did all your transfers and here you are, you know, and uh, one thing that you have to understand is that a lot of these, uh, the modern approach to fertility is very time consuming. It used to be you could do an IVF cycle in, in one month, right? You do the retrieval and you do a fresh transfer, that's it. Now, with the current approach, because of the new protocols and the freezeol and the PGT, and then if they suspect you have endometriosis, they give you Lupron for three months, you're looking at six months sometimes to do one single embryo transfer. That's an enormous amount. That's like a lifetime, okay? It's an enormous amount of time. You're looking at doing a, a year to do two embryo transfers. It's just, it's so time consuming. So why why not, uh, sorry, somebody just came in. Just, I'm doing a, re a recording. Yeah, thank you. Why not, why not, uh, uh, try to figure out what all the potential problems are. Why not try to investigate and look deeper into uh, what the problems could be? I, I personally uh, am a big proponent of being thorough, of planning. Uh, adequate planning helps you make right decisions because sometimes there could be problems that are hard to overcome. Sometimes you may make certain decisions about what you're going to do, whether you're going to, maybe embryo transfers are not working, you're going to back into a surrogate, 
with your own embryos because of a number of factors that you've discovered. And you don't want to just keep on transferring those embryos because they're precious. You want to see what your potential is to make new embryos and then make all those decisions based on that. So uh, definitely for the personalized approach. And, and that's where Pregnion falls into this. Pregnion falls into this very specific area of personalized medicine. And uh, of course, we'll talk about it more into in, in another, uh, we'll have another opportunity to chat like we're chatting now. But I wanted to give you my perspective, my general perspective on, on, on how to look at this and sort of the different philosophies that are in fertility. And cer- certain, I- there's difference in philosophy in certain IVF centers. Some IVF centers are all the, what I call them the brute force IVF center. Keep on trying, keep on trying. Others are more uh, sort of like personalized. And, you know, those are the centers that I recommend them. I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to name any names, but you kind of know when you talk to the doctors of what their philosophy is. So that's it. I just wanted to give a general sort of philosophical perspective in what we do. Of course, uh, if you want to check out Pregimmune, www.pregimmune.com. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about what, what we do is www.preventmiscarriage.com. And of course, you could follow this, uh, this uh, uh, YouTube channel here. There's a lot of surgery and lots of other things. I'm going to put more and more videos here. And uh, so please follow us here. Just give us the follow. And, uh, and uh, also, I recommend you for endometriosis to check out the Endometriosis Summit which is the organization I co-founded with Dr. Sally Sorrell. And we give an enormous amount of information about that. And we also organize a conference, which you should consider attending virtually or in person. So there's a lot of resources, Instagram, endometriosis underscore surgeon. That's me. Um, follow me there too, if you feel like it. And um, I think that's it. And uh, I will, I will, make other videos, other sort of longer videos where people can listen to my ideas and, um, and thoughts and uh, hopefully I'll be able to share your knowledge and help you um, in this uh, very tough uh, challenge that fertility can be at times. Again, Dr. Vidali, I'll see you soon on the, our next uh, chat.